Okay, so J Jamie, why, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about how many years are you guys going now? Um, uh, one <laughs> year. Um, we, I started the company about 18 months ago with my co-founder, Casey Pugh. Um, it uh, came out of, uh, we, we worked with Aziz Ansari on uh, his comedy special and doing a direct-to-fan distribution for uh, his special, which is available five bucks, azizansari.com. And then we worked with Indie Game the Movie, um, which was a darling at Sundance, and then they opted to kind of uh, go uh, with a day and date release where they, they did a theatrical tour, but they also distributed it on iTunes and then from IndieGameTheMovie.com using VHX um, simultaneously. And from there, we uh, raised some venture capital, hired a really amazing team, and we've continued to kind of build out the platform until we are where we're at today, which is um, we have several thousand people using the platform, we have several hundred titles. Uh, selling right now, um, and we're kind of opening up to the public uh, in the very near future. You can actually go sign up uh, right now at VHX.tv. Great. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your experience on, on Indie Game the Movie? Um, I'm not sure if many people are aware of this project, but may maybe kind of explaining as well is how uh, your technology kind of was, was part of an overall campaign on, on that movie. Yeah. Um, Indie Game with Sam Pujado and uh, Jake Sorsky are two uh, first time filmmakers from Canada. And they made this really wonderful documentary about independent ga game developers. And um, they spent several years making it. They raised uh, money on Kickstarter not once but twice. And so throughout the process, they've been doing a great job of audience building, which is something that we really lean heavily on. This idea that uh, filmmakers should be tapping into their audience throughout the pre production, production, post production process and really um, trying to find the people that will be their, their top fans, their supporters, help distribute things through word of mouth online because that's really how things do well on the internet. Um, and so they went to Sundance uh, two years ago. They won the editing award. They were approached by lots of distributors um, who made offers, but they realized that sort of these offers and, and the amount of time that it would take to actually get to market and sort of the restrictions about how it would work, it wouldn't be worldwide, and they knew they had a worldwide audience. Um, were, were very limiting and didn't play into what they wanted to do. And so they um, actually reached out to us on Twitter, and nine days later, we have the site online and selling. Great. And, you know, Indie Game is a documentary. Az Aziz is a comedian. Um, it seems to fit projects that might come with you with, you know, a very clear identity of who, who their audiences are. Um, have you worked on, on many drama projects or something that bit, might be a bit more mainstream? Yeah, we work on all kinds of stuff, actually, like um, uh, not just film and television, but also shorts and even kind of like educational material and any piece of video content that used to be on a DVD could be sold on VHX. And uh, as far as narrative or dramatic pieces go, we also had the pleasure of working with Shane Carruth on Upstream Color, um, which uh, you know doesn't necessarily have a built-in audience exactly. He does have his audience from his fans of his first movie, Primer, and you work closely with the Sundance Institute, the Sundance Creative Services team, to Art Services team, to uh, get the word out. But he did very well, and so it's not necessarily just documentaries and things like this that can do well online. It's, but it really is a question of sort of finding your audience, building your audience. Uh, sometimes we'd say you need to behave more like a band or like a, even like a video game developer than like uh, what traditional filmmakers did. And then we also work actually, Patrick. Uh, we work closely with distributors and people who have more, more than one title. Because in the same way that you could run a site that sells just one movie, you can also run a site that's like a iTunes or like a Netflix that sells lots of movies and even offers subscriptions to many titles, things like that. The idea of the platform is to be super, super flexible and really to let uh, film filmmakers, rights holders exercise things however they want. And you know, you mentioned kind of you know iTunes and, and Netflix there. Um, you wouldn't necessarily see those as, as competitors, would you? Or, or do you feel? Your film can be on VHX as well as these other platforms. And do you want to talk a bit about how that kind of sync up? And in terms of, do you have to have the same price point as iTunes? Or uh, we impose zero restrictions. We work totally non-exclusively. It's just kind of a web service that you sign up for and can use. Um, and we encourage people to distribute to as many platforms as possible. And we actually uh, just published a blog post with some data uh, about two weeks ago, demonstrating how we found that. The more platforms something is available on, the more it increases the sales uh, overall, uh, which speaks to this idea that um, consumers aren't necessarily locked into 
uh, just one way of discovering things. There's lots of ways you discover stuff these days. And the idea of VHX and distributing from your website and sort of your domain name and creating uh, the place where, like if you Google a movie, the top result should be the website where you can kind of buy it as quickly as, and, and watch it as quickly as possible and hopefully maintain that sort of close to the artist connection rather than sort of the website being a cost, a significant cost, um, and you're just driving people to iTunes where you have no data about who is there. You don't get the email address of the customer and you really don't know anything about who the customer is. So we always encourage people to distribute these other platforms, but at the same time, uh, we offer kind of a more favorable split. We kind of expose all the data and we kind of feel that the website is a really natural place to sell. So we always encourage people to make that the home base of the distribution in a lot of ways, the home base for audience building. It's something that you can have up for months or even years before you're actually releasing the title and use it as that audience building destination. But um, when you actually release it, it's always good to cater and, and be in as many places as possible. And for instance, like Indie Game the Movie, when they launched on Netflix, which was about three or four months after they uh, launched on iTunes and launched with us, um, we saw the sales triple when it was available on Netflix. So it all kind of works together to generate more word of mouth and more interest and really the problem is less about sales and more about just awareness. Um, do you want to maybe talk uh, the audience just through the process from a consumer point of view in terms of, you know, someone goes onto a website, you know, maybe sees the button and maybe just talk us through that process. Um, and if anyone wants to do it for themselves, you can uh, go into barbaricgenius.com and uh, try out a purchase yourselves. <laughs> do you have any coupon codes they can use? We should have set that up. <laughs> yeah. We'll set one up after the fact. Okay. That's, that's exactly it. You go to barbaricgenius.com and it says buy now and you put in your credit card or use PayPal and then it throws you into an instant streaming player. That's, um, we always keep ourselves to the gold standard of uh, as good or better than Netflix, which has a really great watching experience. And then you can also download the movie DRM free and so you can put it on all your different devices and take it with you offline. And have you found the DRM free aspect to it? Have you come? Uh, encountered much opposition from distributors and other filmmakers who feel that you know it should be protected in some way? It's an easy discussion to have because um, it's, it's, it's hard for people to explain why DRM exists. They think that it protects things, but it's actually just the opposite um, in some ways because because of the restriction, it actually, many people, it encourages them to pirate it rather than sort of pay for something and that they, that they own ostensibly but they're restricted in how they can use it. And so the way we approach the platform and a lot of the decisions that we've made and the design of the platform and the functionality that we offer is to think like a fan and to think like somebody who is paying for work online and wants uh, to be able to do what they like with it, uh, just like we used to do with the DVD. You know? And it's, um, it's really uh, a shame that so many digital platforms have taken the stance of making the digital version inferior to the physical version. Uh, we feel that it could be much better. It could be easy, you know, sh sharing is a good thing as long as it turns into more sales. And that's, that's kind of the focus of the myth of PRM. And are, are you able to, you know, convince filmmakers or convince distributors that, you know, this isn't an easier route to piracy, the fact that someone can just download an, an MP4 file of, of the movie? Um, how, how has that gone? Oh, it's, again, I, I find it to be an easy conversation because, um, uh, the DRM didn't prevent it from being on the Pirate Bay in the cases where there is piracy. And really the way to look at piracy is that that is interest in your film. And the problem is that it's not available to these people either in their country or in the format that they want. And that's the barrier that we're trying to break down. Um, trying to make things available globally, trying to make them available in formats that are universally accepted. Um, and we, we think a lot about this idea of closing the gaps between interest and availability. Um, and I mean, really, like in Ireland, you must experience this all the time. I know in Canada, they just hate the fact that a movie is available in the U.S., which is like, like a, a five-minute drive for some people, and they can't get the movie. And and that's why people pirate. It's not because they want to steal things. It's because they want to watch it. And um, you know, you talk about kind of um, you know the international aspect of of the business. Um, you know, the traditional model for film distribution would be you know you give it to a sales agent to you know, we'll try and sell territory by territory. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of territories remain unsold and the film, you know, is unavailable then in those territories. Um, it, does your system allow, for example, as part of the finance, if you had, you know, your UK Irish rights were part of a distributor already, can you geo-block 
um, and kind of block out that territory and make the film available in the rest of the world? Yeah, we do support that. And then um, the direction that we're pushing it in, uh, and we do this all the time with films actually where it's available, for instance, everywhere except the United States. But um, the model that we've been pushing is we can actually pay uh, multiple distributors. And so you could have one website that's available globally and we send, uh, we pay out every 30 days and there's a geographic breakdown inside the invoice. And so you could try to, either the filmmaker could hand that money out or one central distributor could hand that out or we could actually pay five different people, 10 different people. And sort of the idea is, um, you know, you can make it available and everybody can sort of benefit from the marketing that's happening inside of each country. Um, but it can be collectively beneficial, right? The, the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts. And have you found a lot of distributors to be open to those conversations? Oh yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, everybody is really looking for ways to tap into the internet and do a better job of this. And the incumbents like iTunes and Amazon and even Vimeo in a lot of ways are, are not necessarily adapting to the new environment that's happening. And, you know, the, the system, it's, it's very much, um, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's an infrastructure for making the film available to audiences, but, you know, I'm sure that has to be complemented then by certain marketing publicity activities by, by the producer or by the distributor or filmmaker. Um, do you want to talk us a bit through from what you've witnessed, what seems to be effective in, in driving business to, to films on the v using the VHX platform? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so, so we're just kind of a software platform for, for whoever is using it to distribute the work and market the work and get it out there. And we take a backseat to all that. We're not directly involved. And so we lean very heavily on the filmmaker, their partners, uh, their distributors, their, their PR people, their marketing people, their partnerships with nonprofits or for-profits or the theatrical tours that we're doing around it as the way of drumming up interest. And, um, Dylan Marchetti from Variance Films has this great saying that it's calling it DIY distribution is inaccurate. Um, nobody can do it themselves. Um, he promotes this idea of uh, do it with others and that it becomes more about finding the right partners, the people who are sort of simpatico to your ideas and, and agree with what you want to do and sort of um, working with those partners to really get it out. Because, I mean, frankly, uh, Patrick, like guys like yourself, you know, you know you've done this before, this is not your first film. You know you know how to reach audiences, you know how these pieces can fit together to promote buzz and how to reach out to festivals and marketing people and there's a huge long process and um, it's always really important to find the right partners to work with. And uh, looking forward, do, do, you, do you still see, you know, this is obviously gonna be a growth area. Do you see a certain demise or, you know, are you gonna encroach into the traditional model in terms of sale, sales agents selling territory by territory and, and traditional distributors, you think? For as well, in the independent sector at least? Uh, I mean, we always like to think of ourselves as being just an augment to everything that's happening, but it's impossible to deny that um, this makes it, like the internet has already made it more complicated to be selling territory by territory in some ways. Like that's why this piracy conversation is happening at all, um, is, is because of the fact that it's released three months later in these different regions. And that's a system that's not going away. Like it's not like the graph just stops. You know, it's just a graph that is slowly declining, and this one is increasing. And we're just trying to get the tools out there and the know-how uh, as early as possible so that this graph can decline or can increase faster. So uh, all those things still exist, but it's sort of the the nature of of, of even aggregators, which um, essentially are sort of just taking a video file and putting it into twenty different places. Um, that's not as valuable as it used to be. Um, can you tell us about any upcoming projects or what's, what's next for you guys or some of the stuff you're working on at the moment? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we just got back from Sundance, which is really exciting, and uh, that's why I'm not able to join you guys in person. Um, we're working on a couple of films there that haven't, haven't been announced yet, but um, we're working on The Act of Killing with uh, Draft House and Vice, uh, which just got nominated for an Oscar, which is very exciting, so you can actually buy it on actofkilling.com. Um, and that's all powered by VHX, the digital copy. Um, then we have a lot of other releases we've done recently. Like I was saying, it's almost 200 now that are selling uh, actively and then thousands of others who are sort of in some stage of audience building. Um, but for us as a company, we're really excited. We're rolling out a lot of new tools, um, more tools around sort of building newsletters, building uh, mailing lists and sending out updates to people. Um, 
we have an exciting partnership we launched with Indiegogo to power a, uh, a live stream of the Roger Ebert documentary Life Itself that uh, it premiered at Sundance and then it uh, streamed simultaneously to their uh, 1900 Indiegogo backers, um, which was a, a Sundance first, kind of a nice technology accomplishment, it went off without a hitch. And in general, kind of launching more tools around supporting crowdfunding. We do like free uh, digital redemption for people who do crowdfunding campaigns. So you can send out those kind of streaming and HD digital downloads to your backers and then the idea is we can take that audience that you're building during crowdfunding and then roll it into the rest of your marketing. And um, you kind of like, you don't have to stop fundraising when the crowdfunding ends, basically. You can still offer pre-orders of the film and then incentivize the pre-orders and then you can sell later and make everything kind of globally available. And while America is, I know you, you tell me, is it, is it your main market at the moment? How, how is the international side lo looking? Or how, can you give us any kind of data in terms of how it break di breaks down? I, mean, I, wish, I, wish, I wish I was there in person because we are trying to get into the international market much more. We're American, so that's kind of like our primary uh, what we know. Um, <laughs> but it works globally. We work with international partners all the time, um, just not as much as I, I, as I would like because um, even on our network, uh, our sales are about 50% outside of the United States. Um, but the makeup of our, of our user base is significantly uh, inside the United States. And so we know that there's all kinds of content being created all over the world. So, I mean, that's even my question for you is how can I better reach um, <laughs> Irish audiences, European audiences, global audiences uh, in terms of the filmmakers and distributors? Too? Yeah, because, you know, do things like this. And, you know, we have the, as well as Digital Biscuit, there's the Jameson Dublin Film Fest and the Galway Film Fly. And, you know, you should come on over. Oh, God, I would love to. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we'll probably kind of take some questions from the audience now. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jamie? Do we have mics there as well? Um, I think there's one here in the middle. Hi, how's it going? Um, my question is uh, is uh, in relation to the using VHX as your kind of platform as your uh, primary web presence for your film online. Um, I know that VHX offers kind of uh, services to if you wanted to incorporate things like you would on a normal website, like a blog and your contact details. But uh, I just want to know like how uh, the how easy is that to work? Is it comparable to platforms like WordPress or something like that? Or and is there kind of a you know what the support system is basically for someone like that. Yeah, it's um, yeah, sometimes we call it like Tumblr for premium video or WordPress for premium video, where it really is as easy as uh, you sign up and you pick a theme and then you can kind of connect it to a, uh, like a Tumblr blog, for instance. We love Tumblr, um, as well as kind of a Twitter feed and it pulls into social media content from those other sites. Um, and then we have like a support button in the top right. and. Um, we have kind of an amazing support team in terms of helping people out with the site design or answering questions. Um, our response time is usually less than 30 minutes. Uh, and I'm very happy to help you answer questions, especially as we kind of start launching uh, more publicly. Great. Is that okay? And there's a question here as well. Uh, how would releasing something with you compare to, say, what Louis C.K. did with his self-distribution? Yeah, it's um, very comparable. That was actually a big inspiration for us. It was a big inspiration for Aziz Ansari. Um, we know the guys who uh, are the design agency who created Louis C.K.'s site. And um, that was kind of a more traditional web, web agency relationship where Louis contacted them and said, can you build me a website? And they spent a few months developing it and um, had to kind of re-implement a lot of the technology that we've created at scale. And really the idea was taking that model and, and making it available you know, at internet scale, which is to say, um, like, like people have questions when we're doing the like, like itself stream, that they're kind of joking uh, about, oh, 1900 backers, like, my favorite part of the movie is the part where uh, the stream fails. Um, but that doesn't happen to us because that's just a small percentage of our traffic. Um, we, we have like a, a really talented tech team. Um, our CTO used to be the director of engineering at Vimeo. My co-founder, Casey Pugh, was an early Vimeo employee who created the Vimeo player. Um, my background is a software developer. We are, we are internet guys. And so the idea is that um, instead of creating ad hoc, one-off websites, we can build these tools that do 90% of the work. And then our theme engine is super customizable, which allows you to do the other 10% if you want to. And then um, 
we never have any delivery problems or payment problems. And then as we roll out updates to the platform as a whole, it kind of improves like the sales conversion across the whole platform. It kind of improves the streaming quality. It improves like when we launch subtitle support, that's available on thousands of websites at the same time. Cheers. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions, sir? Um, you just mentioned there, Jimmy. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, subtitles. You know, obviously the international market. You know, that's something you're going to um, have to deal with. You know, d do people kind of tailor websites for for specific markets then, or is it just? You know, I, I saw on the indie game site, there's like there's a, a ton of subtitles you you, you can download. Mm -hmm. how, how 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 does that work? Uh, yeah, it was uh, really inspiring actually the way they did it. Where they um, they they captioned the film in English and French because they're Canadian. And then they actually just, uh, they just posted on Twitter and said, would you help us translate this into other languages? <laughs> and um, they have a lot of followers. They have like 10,000 followers, but that's, that's not like a million followers. And they still were able to have the film translated into uh, almost 20 languages, including um, someone dubbed it in Ukrainian, which is really fun. <laughs> Uh, apparently, Ukrainian audiences hate subtitles, and they, they insist on dubbing. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, and then you can also translate everything on the site, too. Like, we have sites that are available in Russian, um, uh, Spanish, uh, French, uh, um, most kind of major languages I can think of. And then we're working on features, too, to kind of internationalize the platform, so that if you were, let's say, you know, a, a French speaker and you came in, um, the buy page, the watch page, a lot of our sort of standard pages would at least be translated. And then, um, tools to try to make it easier, too, for the filmmaker to translate the rest of the site, too, as well as translating the subtitles. And in terms of currencies, is it all dollars? Yeah, it's all dollars. We do something where we can display it translated into local currency. So it'll say, like, you know, th this many dollars equivalent to this many euro. Um, but we hope to be able to offer, like, native support in the future, especially if there's more demand. You know, like I was saying, like, 50% of our traffic is international, and so we get requests all the time, and we're always rolling out new features. And I, I probably should have asked earlier, but um, you just mentioned there about Twitter. Um, I've seen it, it's, it's really well integrated with, with the social media tools. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about that, maybe? Yeah, I mean, we're uh, web people. Um, we're internet people. Kind of internet marketing is the backbone of a successful internet release. And so we try to make the site as search optimized as possible, as social media friendly as possible. I mean, that's even why we encourage people to use a custom domain name instead of just using like subdomain.bhx.tv, which is the default. Um, because people on the internet like to go to the website, you know? And um, so we spend a lot of time optimizing that. And we have a lot of new stuff we're actually going to be launching around that over the next couple months. Great. And if people want to kind of get in touch with you or get in touch with VHX, is it a, just vhx.com, is it? Uh, dot TV. Dot TV. For the time being, VHX.TV. And then, um, actually, anybody, it says kind of apply for early access, but uh, don't tell anyone. It's actually available for anybody. If you sign up, it, it throw, <laughs> you, know, the app, you can use it right away. Um, and then we have a contact us button. You can reach us on Twitter. It's at VHX TV. Um, and then I'm at uh, Jamie W.